You may be seated. Well, somebody just say triple. Now, some folk like double. You know, a whole lot of folk preach double, double. Double, double. Shove your neighbor say double, double. Double, double. Double's good, isn't it? I said double is good. Would anybody like to have double joy? Double peace. Double hope. Double victory. I know everybody's going to jump up and shout when I say double finances. Oh, that's what I thought. <laughs> but I found out something. I, I like... I like double. Double is good, but I like triple better. I like a trifecta. I, I like a triple. I like like, I mean, look at me. I didn't get this way looking at it. I like a three cheese pizza. I like some stromboli and some rigatoni and every other kind of oni. All together. I like triple. I like a triple pane window and your Bible announces a three-stranded cord is not easily broken and tonight Pastor Benny Hinn and myself and all of you are going to become that three-stranded cord that every adversarial force arrayed by the alien armies of the Antichrist against you is about to get their eviction notice can you start can you shout eviction that devil's about to back up, back off, back down, back away. Let me read you a passage of scripture. Luke chapter 5. Jesus was teaching, verse 17, and there were Pharisees, teachers of the law, sitting by out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. Would you just thank him that that presence is here now? And then behold, behold, that's a word designed to arrest your attention. That's a word that means what the, what the heaven is about to happen next. I dare you to shout what the heaven is going on around here. I can tell you salvation and joy and victory and blessing. Yoke destroying burden removing anointing. So these cats got together and they brought a man on a bed who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before Jesus when they could not find a way that they might bring him in. Because of the crowd, they went up to the housetop and they let the man down with his bed through the tiling of the roof. He tore the roof off the place. And all we're asking you to do is shout and clap and jump and run and sing and rejoice and have faith and know that God is in the midst to heal his people, spirit, soul, and body. They began to let him down and something arrested my attention. They let him down with his bed through the tiling before Jesus. Verse 20, when he saw their faith, he said to him, man, now wait a minute because you missed it. You can't just read the Bible. You have to read the Bible. The book said, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man. In other words, the man didn't have faith for himself. It was the people in the room that had faith for him. That takes all the pressure off of you tonight because I'm telling you that the God you serve is greater than we preached. He's greater than we have sung about. He's greater than you conceived. He's greater than you've ever perceived. And he is greater than your ability to believe him tonight because God touching you tonight does not depend on whether or not you can believe him. His presence is here to heal you and he has seen our faith on your behalf. So you might just as well go ahead and receive tonight. Three things happened to this man. Somebody shout three things. Yes. Calvary has a triple cure. A triple cure. Number one, Jesus said, man. Now you see, you thought 
that we started that in the 60s. Amen. Man, your sins be forgiven you. Tonight is a night of Ephesians 3, 20 miracles. What, what am I talking about? I'm talking about that miracle that was never supposed to happen. That miracle that there's no way it could happen. That miracle that you've been denied. Somebody's about to run headlong into a right now miracle that's been a very long time coming. Shout if you believe tonight's your night. Shout if you believe this is your moment. This man received something he didn't even ask for. And you're about to as well. Because he's going to do above all that you can even ask or think according to his mighty power which is present in this room and right there where you are. So number one, man, your sins be forgiven. And they begin to argue with him, of course, religious folk. Religion's always trying to talk you out of what God's trying to talk you into. Okay, that didn't go over real big over here. I'm going to try it over here. Somebody that knows, just give me an amen when I say that religion's always trying to talk you out of, you know, all your relatives, all your religious friends. Oh, don't go over there to that meeting. That's not all necessary. No, Lord, let me help you. Religion's just trying to talk you out of what the Holy Spirit is trying to talk you into tonight. And I believe you're going to hear the blessed Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus. And so then we know that the man was healed, do we not? I mean, Jesus said, get up off that bed. But they argued with him. Today, people will not argue as much, although it's getting worse. They won't argue as much about salvation in the name of Jesus as they will healing. Back then, they didn't mind if Jesus healed. They just didn't want him to say he had power to forgive sins. So Jesus said, is it easier to say, man, thy sins be forgiven? Or rise up and walk. I'm here to tell you either one of them are ready for you right now. This cross. This cross. This cross is the hinge upon which the door of all human history swings. It's the pivot round about which the events of the ages revolve. It is the fulcrum of God's grand and glorious lever. 4,000 years in the crafting where one man on one tree on one Friday. Pride of fallen human race out of the diabolical grasp of Satan. I'm talking, of course, about the cross. It's rough, it's rugged, it's mangled, it's mean, it's an angry and biting beam. But it is here at the crossroads of these two rough-hewn wooden beams that you and I tonight can look with horrified wonder upon the raw ferocity of the love of God Almighty for fallen humanity. Two beams, one vertical, pointing simultaneously to heaven, the other to hell. Well, that goes over big in the modern church, doesn't it? The other beam horizontal, stretching out its arms and encompassing the entire planet, including you. This cosmic crossroads sits atop a skull-shaped hill near a garbage dump just beyond the city gates of a troubled little backwater province on the periphery of the vast Roman Empire. Look now upon that center stake suffering, sighing, crying, dying. There, the Lamb of God. There, the Prince of Heaven. There he fought. There hell rallied its forces. There every demon hissed and every demon shrieked. There he unwielded a weapon that hell had never experienced for one red rivulet drop of blood flowing freely down a naked side dripping off his toes into bloody pools upon the earth this cross is the centerpiece of Christianity 
the Old Testament seers prophesied about it. New Testament believers squared their shoulders and prophesied about it. They proclaimed its power. But it seems that we've forgotten that here, here at this intersection, God's limitless provision intersects with our most desperate human need. Here, here, the furious love of God encounters our broken and shattered hearts. Here, God's ultimate triumph conquers Satan's ultimate demise. Here, the blood was shed, bleeding by which God's veins were emptied here. The price was paid here. He shrieked, it is finished. But it seems that in 21st century America and the world, the cross has gone missing. Secretly, stealthily, silently, we've removed it from our singing. We've removed it from our preaching. Uh, it seems that in a crossless generation, crosses are showing up everywhere but where they should be. In a nation where a cross once topped the steeple of every church building from sea to shining sea, mm, far less offenses, offensive images are now found to hang in its place. Wild, godless, scantily clad rock stars gyrating in places we didn't know they had places dangle them around their necks rock stars and professional athletes tattoo and brand their bodies with every size and image of crosses imaginable but here tonight I am on a determined mission of God to bring you once again to the base of an old bloody rugged, angry, mean, and biting beam. For here, alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote this sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I had done he hung upon this tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, love beyond degree at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I'm happy. When I don't have a dollar to change, I'm still happy. If my spouse says they're walking out and never coming back, I'm still happy. If Obama's in the White House or George Bush, I'm still happy all the day. Be seated. Thy sins be forgiven. I have to tell you that Pastor Benny Hinn will be praying for your needs. He will be praying for your healing. I will be agreeing with him. But there is a mandate upon my life. I may have attracted you here. To bring you to a point of decision that you had never contemplated. All during the last month, God's word has been screaming up out of my spirit as I prepared for miracle healing and victory prayer cross service. God kept saying to me, God kept saying to me, Tell them, tell them not to fear him who has power to kill their body. But who has power to cast into hell? I must give you this wonderful warning. It is appointed to every man and woman 
wants to die. And tomorrow is promised to no one. What should it profit a man? Should he gain the entire world and have a body like Charles Adams and lose his soul? It's quiet. Isn't it strange that we no longer recognize the gospel? Jesus came healing but a means to an end the demonstration that he cares about our spirit soul and body this is the reality every person listening to me by multiplied millions around the world right now every person in this room packed and jammed every person in the overflows every person every person is going to live forever oh no no don't shout yet i'm from kentucky i speak slowly Every person is going to live forever. Somewhere. Now the Bible is the only book that gives accurate directions to eternal destinations. You said, well, I don't believe the Bible. Well, that doesn't change it. And in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. And I'm going to ask you to make a decision. I'm going to ask you to make a decision. And you say, well, I just don't think you're right, Pastor Rod. Okay. So if you're right and I'm wrong, and there is no heaven and there is no hell, and the Bible is a lie, then I have lived a life of peaceful, joyful, glorious <laughs> ignorance. But what if I'm right and you're wrong? The Bible talks about a place like heaven, called heaven, a place where we leap like a heart of the everlasting hills of God's glory. To suffer no more, sigh no more, cry no more, die no more. I have no time to speak of such a place, but I will remind you of that other destination. Because Jesus preached ten times more about it than he did about heaven. And your Bible said hell hath enlarged her borders not heaven hell hath enlarged her borders and her mouth gapeneth wide hell a place of everlasting torment a hell where your bible says the smoke of your torment will rise up into the nostrils of god forever and ever you say well i would never serve a god that would send people to hell neither would i and the god i serve would send no one to hell and if you end up there it will be over my prayers it will be over our prayers and your mother's prayers and it will be over the cross of Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ you say pastor Rod you're intense oh I get worse I'm afflicted I have contracted a contagion it is communicable I have to rescue the perishing. I have to care for the dying. I have to remind America and the world that there is only one God, one truth, one cross, one name under heaven whereby we might be saved. The mighty name of Jesus. Everyone standing. Everyone standing, please, quickly, quickly, quickly. No one moving around. There's a little animal in London. It's just about this big. It's a little mole of an animal. It's very interesting because it's born blind. And blind, it spends its life. They're very easy to harvest because they can't see. So you just go out and pick them up and people make beautiful garments out of them and the like. We say, well, how do they do that? Do, do they wait for them to die? No, 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 no. They take a little wooden mallet and they just pop it on the head. And when it dies in that very moment for the first time in its life, its eyes come up. It is a point that a man wants to die. And after that, the judgment. 
And if the world had been any less damned, if you had been any less lost, if you had been any more depraved and in need of a Savior, he never would have come to this being. But he came. And this is what he says. God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish, but have everlasting life. I ask you for 60 seconds. Job said, Daniel said, men run to and fro so they don't think about God. Job said, when I pause for a moment and consider the Lord, I fear him. Hell is real. Heaven is real. Eternity is long. Flight 427 was scheduled to take off from Chicago's O'Hare International Airport, which it did, en route to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Just a short flight, a beautiful day. The weather was 78 degrees, beautiful white puffy clouds in the sky. The visibility was 15 miles. The wind at a calm three miles per hour. They boarded the plane, 132 souls. Isn't it interesting when the news reports come out, they always say souls, not bodies, souls. 132 were on board, flight 427, six and one half miles northwest of the Greater Pittsburgh International Airport. The left wing of that 737 dipped slightly to the left. It went into an uncontrollable spin. And 23 seconds later, 132 souls were in eternity. Your Bible says tomorrow's promise to no man. Today is the day of salvation. Oh, I want you to receive healing in your body. I want that cancer to leave you. I want the cataracts to come off your eyes. I want manifestations of miracles and deliverance and healing. But wait! More than anything, I want you to leave this building tonight pillowing your head with a full assurance that you are as sure for heaven as if you were already there with your sins forgiven washed in the blood of Jesus. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't want anyone looking around. Please, 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 in obedience to the Holy Spirit. Right there where you are, no one can make the decision for you. You say, Pastor, I'm a good person. Being a moral person and going to church will not take you to heaven. That is a lie. Jesus Christ shed his blood and he said, come and accept me and confess me before men and I'll confess you before my father and you will become not a different person that tries to do better. You will become a new creation that has never existed before. Would you let Jesus cleanse you? Would you let him set you free? Would you let him do what he came to that cross to do to give you eternal life? Would you do it? I'm going to count to three in 23 seconds. Give me your attention just for a moment. I wonder what would have happened if I'd stood up on that aircraft 30 seconds before its wing dipped and said, tomorrow your soul may be required of you. I wonder if I had said on that aircraft what I've said tonight, they would have laughed me to scorn, would they not? But 23 seconds later, no one would be left. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. I'm counting to three over the next 23 seconds. When I say three, I want you to shoot your hand up in the air more bravely and more boldly than you've ever done anything in your life. I want you to shoot your hand up in the air and say, Pastor Rod, pray for me. I don't want to leave this building tonight unsure of my eternal destiny. I want to know I'm on my way to heaven. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know I have eternal life. I'm counting one. 23 seconds. 23 seconds between 
the decision that will seal your eternal destiny heaven or hell life or death God or Satan you choose you choose it's your opportunity two ten seconds ten seconds your palms feel heavy you feel like you want to run out the back of the building you don't you feel like you don't know what to do I'm here to tell you right now softly and tenderly Jesus is calling you haven't done anything big bad mean ugly enough to get you to be separated from God for eternity God loves you Satan hates you you can be a new creature when you leave this room tonight on three raise that hand and let's pray bravely and boldly one two three raise that hand and leave it up do not put it down do not put it down leave it up leave it up leave it up leave it up don't put it down I was going to invite you to this altar but two-thirds of you wouldn't even be able to get anywhere near the altar there are well over a thousand people with their hands raised right now here's what I want you to do I want every single one of you with your hand raised wave it around with a hand raised wave it around I want somebody close to you right now I want you to look them in the eye and I want you to say I'm going to heaven let's pray together everybody pray this prayer pray it out loud out loud to make the person in front of you mad you're praying so loudly are you ready Heavenly Father I come to you now born a sinner in need of a Savior I've heard the gospel I accept Jesus Christ I believe in him and this night I confess him as my personal Savior I will live for you Jesus as you show me how it feels so good to have my sins forgiven and know I'm on my way to heaven I can almost clap and shout oh why not If you'll shout one more time, Jesus saves, you can be seated. You may be seated. You may be seated. I want every single one of you that raised your hand. This is the easiest way I know to do it. Reach in front of you and there's an envelope. Grab that envelope. You don't have to put anything in it. I'm not receiving the offering. I just, I need your name, your address, an email or a phone number so that I can put it in our altar and pray for you. Please, please, please do it. If you prayed that prayer, please, please, please do it. Please do it. Please do it right now. You said, Pastor, I thought you were talking about a triple cure. Salvation, healing, and prosperity when a Roman centurion thrust that crown of thorns into his brow the curse of poverty met its doom Genesis chapter 3 your Bible says, by the sweat of your brow shall you labor. And even as you labor, the ground will bring forth nothing but thorns and thistles. Your Bible declares that it is not God's will that you rise up early and stay up late and eat your bread with sorrow. Your Bible says that the blessing of the Lord makes rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. So I'm going to give you the opportunity again to choose. His blood broke the curse. When they plaited that crown of thorns and thrust it deep in his bruised and hemorrhaging brow, 
the curse was broken. Galatians 3.13, he redeemed us from that curse of Genesis 3. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is anyone that hangs on a tree. Jesus paid the price for your salvation. He paid the price for your healing. And he paid the price for your financial freedom.